Good morning, Burleson family. Let's stand as we sing together this morning, worshiping our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose word is true. We can take him on his promises. They never fail. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your
church, you can have a seat. It is so great to be worshiping with you today. I hope that your hearts are ready for worship this morning. If you're one of our new people, we want to extend a very special welcome to you. I don't know what brought you in today, but I am so glad that you're here today. Uh, there's two things you need to know about our church. Um, maybe three things. We're not perfect. One, but we are all about pursuing Christ and loving people. And we're doing that to the best of our ability, the best way that we know how to do, whether it's a Sunday morning worship service, whether it's the ministries going throughout the church during the week, that is what we are all about here at First Baptist Burleson. Uh, I wanna help you get connected to the things that are happening in the life of our church. A couple ways you can do that. One, if you scan the QR code that's on the screen, that'll help you sign up for some events that we're gonna talk about. Uh, there's a connect card on there for our new people. That's your way to let us know that you are here today and it gives us uh, the chance to reach out and connect with you later this week. And we'd just be greatly, uh, greatly appreciative if you took the time to fill that out today. Or you can stop by the info centers in the comments after the service. We'd love to meet you there as well. This is usually the time in our service where we continue in the act of worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. You'll see a few ways that you can do that on the screen. Uh, and we want to let you know a couple ways that your giving is impacting the kingdom uh, locally and globally. And today we have a local story. Uh, in our school district, uh, they have allowed us to go in and host these clubs called uh, Kids Beach Club. It's an after school program where we get to talk to kids about Jesus inside their schools, which we're so appreciative for our school dis district to allow us to do that. And for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have some Bibles in the comments and in the atrium. And it would just be uh, greatly appreciated if you stopped by there uh, to, to, to write a note that's gonna go inside those Bibles, that's gonna be taken to the home of a, of a, of a child in our school district. Uh, they're gonna be blessed with the word of God and blessed by whatever encouragement that you write for them. So after the service, uh, stop by that table, uh, fill out one of those notes so you can be a part of that ministry that's ongoing. We have some incredible volunteers that do that for us on a weekly basis and we're so thankful for them. Well, that's all that I have for you right now. Would you please stand up and tell somebody it is great to see you today.
you're constant, I've witnessed it, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again, you love and I've witnessed it, you heal and I've witnessed it, you save and I've witnessed it, and I'm confident, I'll see it again and again. Final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known Before the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose Across this room today. All hail King Jesus. And all hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. That's who you are today. The Savior. The Savior. There was a moment when the sky lit up. A flash of light breaking through. When all was lost, he crossed eternity. The King of Life was on the move. For in a dark, cold tomb, 
That is our praise this morning, God. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to save us. We thank you for the beautiful story of the gospel. Because it's the story that each one of us has an opportunity to say yes to. That we can leave a life of striving, we can leave a life of chasing, we can leave a life of trying to be somebody that maybe the world approves. And God, we can let all that aside and we can say yes to a Savior, His name is Jesus. We declare that you are holy. There's no one like you, God. Thank you that you don't desire anything else from us other than a surrendered heart. But God, if we're honest, that's difficult to do every single day. It can be so easy to come in this room and, and to maybe have it for a moment. To silence all the distractions and just be fixated on who you are. But that's harder when we leave this place. That's harder when we're dealing with a difficult relationship or a situation or temptation. But God, would you unite our hearts with yours? And would you put our priority in the right place? Which is you first. 
Help us to do that as your people. God, as we open your scriptures, would you speak so clearly to us this morning? Would you open our eyes, open our ears to see and hear what you want us to see today? We love you. It's in Jesus' beautiful name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen and good morning to you all. Thank you very much, Corbin. I appreciate that. Good morning to you all. If you guys would, was that not an incredible time of worship? Would you please encourage our worship band for all that they do in leading worship for us? Thank you. And thank you, of course, to God for allowing us to do that. Uh, in the, I have an announcement to share with you that in the United States of America, Baptists are the largest evangelical denomination. And of all of the states in our great union, Texas has the most Baptists. For 138 years, God's favor has rested upon this Burleson church as a beacon of hope to the surrounding community and to the nations of the world through our missions efforts. And this past Tuesday, God provided yet another opportunity for the influence of this church to grow when our lead pastor was voted in as the new president of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Would you please join me in celebrating this historic moment by wel wel welcoming my friend, our lead pastor, Dr. Ronnie Marriott. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, too kind, too kind. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that, was, this, that was his idea. I hope you know to, to do that, but I do appreciate it. Um, I am excited about this opportunity. It's something I'd look forward to do for quite a while. And um, a couple things that I guess need to clear up because there's a lot of questions about what does that mean. First of all, I'm not leaving First Burleson. Um, <laughs> I pause there to see how you're going to react because I didn't, I wasn't sure. Um, this is a volunteer position. There's no money in being president, whether it's president of the United States or president of BGCT, but um, it's a volunteer position. Uh, that, but I do feel honored and humbled to get to serve in this role. Uh, something that Robin and I love doing is helping, encouraging pastors and spouses, and through that, their churches. So this, this will give us a platform to do that all over the state, uh, be traveling around different. So there, there'll be a greater demand on, on, on my time. Uh, and so I can say this, one of the reasons I felt led to do it, but also okay to do it, is because of the incredible staff we have here at our church. And uh, led by our wonderful executive pastor, the best in the world, Christopher Cass, and dear friend of mine, I don't have to worry about anything falling apart, uh, you know, or, or blowing up while I'm gone on different things. So that gave me great confidence to accept this opportunity. And so I'm grateful for them and uh, pray for the staff uh, as they carry on different things. I mean, I'll, I'll be here, but you won't even know when I'm not here uh, because they do such a great job. And so that gave me confidence to do it. But it, it is an opportunity to have, speak, have a voice in what's going on in our state convention. Uh, there are 5,300 Texas Baptist churches in the state. So to get to have some influence into that, speak into that, encourage. Like tonight, we're going to uh, First Baptist Colleen. Uh, it's their 150-year anniversary, so I've been invited to come and just share a little bit and encourage that church, and that's stuff I love getting to do, so we'll be down in, in Colleen. So things like that. I mean, there's politics involved in any group of people, so we'll be involved in that as well. Um, but I've been a Texas Baptist all my life served in various committees and various boards uh, throughout my, my ministry. And I love Texas Baptist. I'm excited about what's going on and excited to get to be a part, uh, at least speaking into the future of that organization. So, so thank you very much uh, for allowing me to do that, even though you didn't know you were allowing me to do that. Um, can we, let's pray. God, we, we thank you for uh, your invitation to be here today. It is good to be with family. It is good to be in your presence together. We know that your Holy Spirit lives in us, uh, and it is a supernatural experience when we come together uh, to worship you. And God, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to speak to us. We know that you have a word for each of us as individuals, as couples, as families, as a church. Uh, but God, our purpose is to bless you today. We pray that all that we say and do brings honor and glory to you, and that you have a great morning this morning as your children gather. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, uh, Robin and I traveled to the Northeast. We'd never been uh, to the New England states, and so we wanted to go there. One reason was to beat the heat of Texas. 
Uh, it was 95 degrees uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, while we were there. So that didn't work. I guess we brought it with us. Uh, but others just to see that part of the world, never seen that part of the country. And one of the cool things we got to do, so Boston was kind of our home base, and every day we traveled to a different city, different, a different state. That's so weird being in Texas. I travel two hours, I'm in a different state, right? I travel two hours here, I'm in Sherman. So it's just a whole different kind of experience. Uh, and so one of the places we went was to Providence, Rhode Island. People love Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, all right, say. So one of the unique things about Providence, Rhode Island is it the first Baptist church built in America is in Providence, Rhode Island. And so we got to tour that. We got there at a time they were having a tour, got to meet the pastor, spent some time with the pastor, and just kind of hearing all the cool, cool stories, how Roger Williams built that church, the design all behind it. In fact, I have a picture uh, of the first Baptist church ever built in America, <clears throat> known as the First Baptist Church of Providence, uh, and just very beautiful structure. And you can see the tall steeple on that and the, the tall building uh, inside was really cool. And then we traveled around some other cities. I mean, you know, being a pastor, I want to see churches. Here's another church that we saw. This one was in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, we went there. To, this is not Bush's house, uh, but it wasn't too far from where the Bushes have their home. And so there's a church there. And then we got to see another church uh, in Boston. So this is right by Boston Commons another church, and there are churches all over the place in that area. Do you notice any similarities there in those three churches? They all have steeples, and they're all designed tall. And the, the reason behind this, there's reason behind it, it is to draw the eye upward to the heavens. To, to, it's, it's a sense of awe and reverence as you look up to the heavens to see God's dwelling place. And so it was built with that in mind, that, that perspective of who God is and who we are, that we stand before a holy God. We are the people of earth, his creation, and he is creator of all things. All hail King Jesus, as we just sang. And, and so you take that, and in fact, the temple in Jerusalem was built the same way. The two temples that were built were built much like those churches. Uh, in fact, I found out that the, the chapel at Dallas Baptist University is designed after that first church in Providence uh, that Roger Williams built. Uh, but now, even looking at the temple, you, if you see drawings of the original temple, the big columns, the buildings that draw the eye upward, again, you had the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was the presence of God, but the, the concept was God is in his heavens, he is creator of all things. Now, you can contrast that with today's modern churches, even like ours, they're more horizontal. So you see them kind of long and spread out. I and mean, there may be a steeple, maybe a cross like this one, but they're kind of, kind of long and flat for the most part. And that kind of comes out of a different perspective of God, that he is here among us, that God is present with us. So even in the architecture of churches, we see a statement being made. Neither are wrong. Both are beautiful. But a, a different idea of God being in the heavens and also God being here with us, even in this room, which we know both are true. But what we also understand, church is more than architecture, church is more than landscaping, church is more than the, the furniture inside. The church is the people. You and I are the church. We, we often call this as the house of God. But the truth is, you and I are the house of God now. The Holy Spirit lives within us. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible calls us. So we realize, much like you say, your house is made out of brick and mortar, but that house, that brick and mortar doesn't make a home. It's the family inside that makes it a home. It's the love, it's the relationship, the support, the forgiveness, all that. So the same thing in a church, it is not the, the structure that we have that makes it a church. It is you and me inside, the people, make it a home. And we want this to be a, a home for people. We want it to be a home for those who desire to walk closer with the Lord. We want it to be a home for people who are seeking and searching, the, the critics, the doubters of God. We want this to be a place they experience home. The minute they walk in our parking lot, we want people to experience the love, see the expression of the grace of God through you. So we harp on all the time. When you walk by somebody in the hall, smile and say hi. You have no idea what that person is going through, and that's, that may be the spark they needed to realize somebody cares about them. Because there's a lot in this world that makes us doubt that anybody cares about us. 
It's kind of why we're going through this book of Ecclesiastes. There are a lot of people struggle with identity and, and purpose and meaning. Why am I here? Is there a God? Can I relate to him? What is this all about? And what's next? The deep yearnings of our soul. And you are a minister to others when you express the love and the grace of God by a simple handshake or a simple smile. This should be the friendliest place you could visit on a Sunday morning. It should be the most loving, accepting place that anybody could ever find on a Sunday morning, and not just Sunday morning, anytime they're here, right? So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open to the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 5. Again, as we go through this book, written by Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and we deal with some of the questions. As you're turning, let me read what Paul says in Ephesians 2 about us, <clears throat> verses 9, 19, and 20. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. One of the reasons we study the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is because upon those prophets, those priests, we are building the church. God established his church from the beginning of time, and we are building upon what has already been laid. But the the key is that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Everything we do is built upon Jesus, the chief cornerstone. So if you've ever been a part of a building, oftentimes they'll lay a cornerstone, which is kind of a monument to that building. But everything builds out of that. So your life, our church, pursuing Christ, loving people, all of that is built out of Jesus as a chief cornerstone. He is our foundation. If we build on anything else, it will fall. If we build on personalities, if we build on ministries and programs, if we build on buildings, it will eventually fall. It has no eternal effect. Only Jesus, the cornerstone, does. So Solomon, in his pursuit of joy and happiness in life, is coming to this conclusion that all is meaningless without God. But with God, all things are awesome. Not that there's not tragedy, suffering, and sorrow, but our lives have purpose and meaning because they are with God. So Ephesians chapter 5, let's look at the first seven verses. Solomon here is, is basically describing for us how to worship God. Verse 1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin, and do not protest to the temple messenger. My vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless, therefore fear God. So the first thing Solomon says to us in this act of worship that we are involved in this morning is to guard your steps. This became meaningful to me when uh, Robin and I were in Israel last year. And I think I've described this to you. We got to go to Jerusalem to see the Temple Mount, to see the ruins of the old temple destroyed back in AD 70. And, of course, you could still see the, the big walls and, and the outer walls of the temple. But what was really stood out to me were the steps leading up to the temple. And there were a lot of steps. And it was, it was quite a climb to get up to the temple wall, to the, to the gates to get into the temple. And, and the, the steps were very uneven. They were jagged. They weren't smooth. Some were tall. Some were thin. You had to really pay attention where your foot was going or you would fall. We, you had to really guard your steps, right? You had to watch what was happening and where you're about to step so you didn't fall. And so this is kind of the idea that Solomon, who built the temple, who built the first temple, right? So he's built the temple, and they built it in such a way that you had to guard your step going up to the temple. For one, you had to focus where you were walking, <clears throat> and the, the reason behind that was that your mind began to release all the cares that you brought up to the temple. As you were focusing on your steps, you began to forget about what you were worried about when you got there, when you drove into the parking lot. 
You begin to focus and clear your mind to prepare your mind for worship. The other thing it did, you had to have your head down. So it was a, it was a symbol of humility. You were, you were bowing your head before a holy God as you entered into the temple. So the time you entered the gate, you were humbled and your mind was clear to hear and receive from God. Isn't that awesome? Even in the architecture of the temple, it had a purpose <clears throat> to prepare you to be in the presence of a holy God. It was that same perspective that God is in his heavens and he is righteous, he is holy, he is king of kings, he is lord of lords. He is the bread of life, he is living water. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. There is no greater. He is creator, he is counselor, he is friend. He is lord and he is judge. My fear is we've lost a reverence for God. Maybe we need to redesign our steps around our building. We design them in such a way it's easy and smooth, hopefully. <clears throat> but <clears throat> we still need to prepare for worship and for entering into the presence of God. We know God is always with us. But listen, guys, what we do here matters. Being here matters. There's something supernatural going on. God brought you here for a reason or online for a reason. God doesn't waste a millisecond of our time. You're here for a purpose. And so Solomon is realizing this, and he's, he's encouraging us as we come to guard our steps, to, to clear our minds, to be prepared. Psalm 27, 4 says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Did you come to church this morning seeking the Lord? Are you focused on how beautiful our God is? This is the desire and the design. Because God has promised to meet with us here. The Bible says, where two or more are gathered, I am with you. Well, there's more than two here, so he's here. He's here even if you're one, right? But that's the concept. Being together is important. Being together with the, the family of faith is important. He has promised to be here. And not only has he promised to be here, he's promised to speak to your life directly. You can't say, well, that, I'm so glad Ronnie preached that message because some of those people need to hear it. No, you need to hear it. And God has something to say to you that I may not even say. I, I can't tell you how many times somebody comes up to me and says, I loved it when you said that, and I never said that. I go back and look at the recording. I never said that. That was God speaking very directly to that person. That's his promise. He speaks directly to us because he has a will and a plan for us. When, when we come with this intent, it indicates that we are spiritually alive. We often say, God, Jesus did not die to make bad people good. Jesus died to make dead people alive. And when you accept the truth of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice and his resurrection, you become spiritually alive. Yesterday, Robin and I traveled to Houston for the funeral of my pastor friend whose daughter was killed. I shared that story last week. And so we went there to the funeral. It was at First Baptist Woodlands. And there were probably four or 500 people there. She was 26 years old, teacher. So you had people from the school district, people from the church, people from the community, uh, friends and family uh, from her life. And, and the pastor got up and said, this is a celebration of life. And I got to tell you, it was a celebration of life. They understood what that meant. Everybody says that at a funeral, but usually funerals are just kind of downers. This one was a celebration. I mean, we stood, there was jazz music playing. They st we stood up and clapped, and we sang, and we praised. And God was given glory in the midst of a terrible tragedy. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. As the pastor and the father, he gave the eulogy, he gave a message, and he drew our hearts to God. And God was praised and given glory, even though there were still questions, doubt, and anger about what happened. And it was a beautiful moment. But one of the things that I'm, I'm in there and, and we're praising and clapping and singing and standing and everybody, I mean, everybody was into this except for one. And that was Bree's body in that casket. She is the only one that didn't sing. You know why? Dead people don't sing. Now, she's singing in heaven. 
That's not her anymore. That's a shell. But that lifeless body didn't sing. I wonder how many times when we don't praise and worship God with the opportunity, is that an indication we are dead spiritually? How can you not worship the God when you realize what he has done for you and how much he loves you? How can you not sing praise? I don't care if you have a good voice or not. How can you not show him your love for him? He definitely showed it for us, didn't he? This is what Solomon is saying. You need to be ready when you have the opportunity to worship a holy God. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is everything. And it is amazing when you stop and think about it that that God cares about you. That that God is blessed by your praises and by your prayers and by your worship. And that's what he desires. We have nothing to give him. He is in need of nothing, but he desires a relationship. He desires to hear what hurts us. He desires to celebrate when we celebrate. That is so cool (laughs) that he does that because he loves us. Solomon is understanding this as he's tried all these roads and traveled down all these dead-end streets. He's starting to realize it is all about God. This is where I find joy and purpose and meaning and happiness. Paul says this in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's going to be weird, isn't it? You just sing to each other all the time. That's not what he's saying. It says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing I've discovered and you've discovered that people filled with the Spirit of God are filled with worship. This, this singing, this speaking to each other, this treating each other right, it's, it's an indication we're filled with the Spirit of God. People who are filled with the Spirit of God produce the fruit of the Spirit. Paul in Galatians 5, and 23, let me just read that for you describes for us the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what you realize when you read that passage, it is not fruits of the Spirit. It is fruit of the Spirit. It's singular, not plural. These words that Paul uses describe that one piece of fruit. You can't say, well, I'm a gentle person, so I don't have to be a kind person. I'm patient, so I don't have to be encouraging. No, if you are filled with the Spirit of God, you will produce the the fruit of the Spirit of God. All of that will be evident in your life, in your character, in your relationships, and how you treat other people. That is the evidence that we are filled. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Those filled with the Spirit produce the fruit of the Spirit. That should define and describe us as Christ followers. In fact, this is one of the reasons why every Sunday we do a This Is Us statement. To remind us of how we are to treat one another in the family of God. They will know you are disciples when they see how you love each other. That starts in the church. If we can't love one another, it's going to be really hard to love an unbelieving world. So we say these statements just as a reminder of how we're committed to treat one another. This Sunday... This is our statement. We do not criticize each other. We show mercy. Can we say that together out loud in commitment? We do not criticize each other. We show mercy. Why? Because we have received mercy. We show unconditional love. Why? Because we have received unconditional love. We show grace to one another. Why? Because we are filled with the grace of God. It's not something you and I can do on our own. We're very petty. We're very selfish without Christ. But because of the Spirit within us, we produce the fruit of the Spirit. And therefore, we bind together. So God's intent when you were coming to worship, first of all, is to prepare you spiritually. To speak to you. He doesn't necessarily wait till you get to church to speak to you. He may have spoken to you on the road. He may have spoken to you last night or maybe even in a dream. Because he wants us to be spiritually alive. God wants us to be spiritually alive. He wants to spiritually assist us, right? This is not something we can do on our own, but the Holy Spirit guides us. He teaches us. He prays on our behalf. He intercedes for us. 
He teaches us what Jesus taught. He teaches us about the kingdom. And then because God wants us to be spiritually active. It's one thing to say I'm spirit-filled. It's another thing to demonstrate it. It will be demonstrated if it's true. And so God assists us in this. So we need to prepare to be in his presence for worship. Prepare expectantly. Did you expect God to say something to you today? Or is Sunday morning just a ritual for you? It's a box that you can check. I did my religious thing. Did you expect God to say something to you? Did you expect God to move in a powerful way? If he doesn't, maybe it's because we don't think he's going to. Did you come hopeful? Did you come with joy? Some of us had a really tough week. But this, again, should be a place we come and experience joy. Joy is contagious. So I may not be joyful when I walk in, but if I meet a bunch of joyful people, I'm going to get joyful. Or if I can bear my burden with somebody and tell someone what's going on, they can pray for me and encourage me, then I get joyful. That's what it means to be a family, to care about one another. So the, what Solomon is saying basically, first of all, are you tuned in this morning? Are you tuned in to what the Spirit wants to say to you? Because God has something to say to you. Are you expecting him to, to speak to you in a very powerful, specific way? Have you confessed your sin? Or you confess, again, as, you, as those people walked up the temple, they were humble. They were in confession, realizing, I want to rid myself of all my sin before I walk into the Holy of Holies, before I walk into the presence of God. It's a time of humility, a time of confession. Bow down. It's interesting. So... Saturday, it's, I know, a busy time. Probably most of us were at a ball game or something, watching on TV, whatever. Saturday is a great time of rest and relaxation. We spend Saturday on ourselves. Typically, we're out doing things maybe late at night. Uh, maybe we don't get enough sleep. We, this morning was crazy. Breakfast didn't turn out. Flat tire, whatever. All this distraction is going on. And then we kind of rush into church and sit down and say, okay, I'm, gonna worship. I'm ready to worship God. And we leave the service, I got nothing out of that today. Well, maybe because you weren't prepared for it. Maybe because you weren't ready for it. Right? So, so let me ask you a question. What did you do last night? Well, I, I know what you did if you're a Baylor Bear fan. In fact, maybe this morning the first thing you need to do is confess what you screamed at the TV. <laughs> I know what you did if you're a Longhorn fan. You rejoice. We're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, right? That's used, that was a college football verse, right? But what did you, Saturday night, did you give any consideration for Sunday morning? Did you make sure you had enough sleep? Did you make sure you had a good breakfast? Did you make sure you're hydrated? Did you prepare last night for this morning? Probably most of us did not, to be honest. I think worship on Sunday morning starts Saturday night, getting our hearts and minds ready then. It's kind of that walking to the temple. It's going to take a while, but by the time we get here, maybe, hopefully, our minds and hearts are ready to receive what the Lord has for us, why he brought us here, and more importantly, that he will be honored and praised by what we say and do. This is what Solomon has discovered. In verse 2, he says, watch your mouth. First of all, don't talk too much. <laughs> That's our tendency, right? When we go to prayer, we do all the talking. Sometimes we come into worship, and all we do is we do all the talking. We don't listen. We need to listen as much as we talk. And, and what he's saying here also is don't just give empty words. Don't make this ritualistic. Don't just say things that you don't mean. I mean, we sing songs that we didn't write, but they can actually be a prayer from us to God. When you consider the words that are being said, if we believe that the Holy Spirit gave the words to those who wrote the songs, then it's an act of praise to God. Isn't that awesome? That's amazing. I'm not a songwriter, but I can sing the words that somebody wrote that came from God, and that returns back to God. That's a form of worship. As we read Scripture, as we pray, he's saying to us, don't engage in meaningly, meaningless, mechanical acts of worship. Don't let it just be a thing you do. Understand that you are in the presence of God. 
He is here in this place. Because the truth is, when we worship God, <clears throat> he listens to our heart through a stethoscope. You know, we can, we can put on the masks and the costumes and speak the religious language, and we can fool each other. We can convince one another that everything is okay with us spiritually. That we are walking in the Spirit. But God knows our heart. He knows the depths of our heart. He knows the reality of what's going on in our heart. But you know the good news about that? As scary as that sounds, he loves us unconditionally. He wants our heart to be pure, not hearts of stone, not cold-hearted. He wants to have hearts that are connected to his. And he does that through his Holy Spirit. So watch your mouth. Verses 4 through 6, he says, keep your vows. It's a common response in an act of worship to make a vow to God. God, I will do this. I promise. We might not use the word vow, but I commit to this. I believe you're challenging me, convicting me. I'm going to do this. So we, it's often a response to the Lord. In fact, every Sunday I present a challenge to you based on the message, something you could practically do to reflect what we learned about God that day. In, in some sense, that's committing a vow. I'm going to do this, Lord, to deepen my walk with you, to broaden my influence through your kingdom. So Solomon says, when you make a vow, keep your vow. And don't delay in making your vow. When God impress that on your heart, commit that to him. Don't say to God, well, God, i got to pray to you about what you just told me to do. No, I'm telling you what to do. This is, this is the response of prayer. This is what I'm saying to you. You don't need to talk to me anymore about it. Just go do it. I'll be with you every step of the way. Don't delay in making a vow. And once you make a vow, don't try to take it back. So don't say it if you're not ready to follow through. And once you say it, you can't come back, oh, sorry, God, I didn't really mean that. And we do not say that, but do our actions not reflect that? In the, in the heat of the moment, in, the, in an emotional time, we may make a vow to God that we never really intended to keep because somehow we're trying to fool him into thinking we're okay. He knows everything. We can't fool him. Right? So when we make a vow, we're to keep the vow. There was a man in my church when I pastored here in Hearst, Lee Settle. Lee Settle was on the beaches of Normandy during D-Day and just horrific story, her incredible testimony of how he is in a foxhole, right? Bullets whizzing over his head, explosions going off, just all the carnage that was there. And in this foxhole, he prays to God, God, if you get me out of here, I will serve you every day of my life. And God spared his life, and he fulfilled that vow. He was a pillar he was a patriarch. He was a servant of the Lord in our church to the day he died. With physical limitations, it didn't matter. He was a prayer warrior. He was a servant. He was a deacon. He gave. He praised. He served. He fulfilled that vow. And people say, oh, man, come on, that was a lot of stress. You were afraid of your life. God's not going to hold you to that. Lee thought that he would. Lee believed that he would. And God will. And he fulfilled that vow. And God used that man, a lay person in our church, to impact me and so many others. Because Lee made a vow to God. And he wasn't going to let anything stop him from fulfilling that vow. That's what Solomon's saying. When we commit to the Lord, we need to take that seriously. When we commit to living a life that honors him, we need to take that seriously. When we commit to God to forsaking our sin and following him, we need to take that vow seriously. When we commit to God, we're going to take ourselves off the throne and we're going to keep him as number one. We need to take that vow seriously. God holds us to these vows. So don't make it flippant. Know what you're getting into when you make it, but when you feel convicted to make it, make it. And then keep it, and trusting God to help you keep it. Then in verse 7, he basically tells us that we need to stand in awe of God. 
To fear the Lord doesn't mean to run away from him in fear. It's the idea of a holy reverence, a sense of awe. When's the last time you felt awe before God? It kind of goes back to those churches with the steeple. To consider the God of the heavens, that's an awesome thought. It produces awe. I love that God is familiar. And God desires to be familiar. He desires to be our friend. But let's not you lose the sense of aweness awesomeness about our God. Let's not lose a sense of reverence when we consider God and who he is. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is holy and righteous, perfect and blameless. We are not, not even close. When is the last time you fell on your face before God to thank him for loving you? to thank him for providing for you, to confess your sin before him, acknowledging that you blew it. I pray that we never lose that sense of respect. We never lose the sense of what it means to be a child of God. Again, it's not a terror running away from our sin or because we're sin, it's more of a running to him. It's a commitment. Rather than following the ways of the world, I will follow the ways of my God. And I mess up, but God has allowed me to confess and repent and restore that fellowship. And so the minute the Holy Spirit convicts me, I do it right then. And I get back on track following God and his plan and purpose for my life. This is where I find joy, and this is where I find meaning. And when you think about it, our, our gifts to God are very feeble. We have nothing to offer him of any significance. We have no gift of worship, act of worship that measures up to who he is, yet he receives it because we do it out of hearts of love. We do it out of love. Motivation. Love is our motivation to give gifts of praise and glory to God. And as a perfect father, he receives them. It's, it's kind of like those, those paintings that your kid gave you, right, in art class or VBS or in life group that they painted with watercolors or with crayons or they drew with pencils and they brought it home to you. And how did you respond when your child gave you that picture? Like it was a Rembrandt. It was refrigerator worthy. Right? You filled your refrigerator with those gifts. Not because they were the best art you'd ever seen, because it was given to you out of a heart of love as an expression of love to you. You probably still have a keepsake box somewhere of your kids. Your kids may be 50 years old, but you still have that box that you go back to to remind you when that child gave that to you as a, when they were kids. Nobody else thinks it's worth anything, and you've often thought, should I get rid of it? But you don't because you remember it was a gift to you, a gift of love. This past week, Christopher and I went over to Norwood Elementary. You remember a few weeks ago, uh, Leanne was up here, and so we gave $5,000 to Burleson Independent School District to help the counselors to meet needs to buy coats or food or socks or whatever to kids in need. So we were over there delivering that check to Norwood Elementary, and they were just so thankful and so grateful for what we did. And so what I noticed in the front office of that school, they had three pieces of art in frames, and they were all done by elementary school kids. Can you imagine that kid walking by the front office where the principal lives and there's their artwork on the wall? Can you imagine how good that child felt to see? This is what Solomon is saying. Our art may not measure up to the greatest art in the world. Our, art, our gifts do not measure up to the worthiness of our God. But God receives them with joy and he puts them on his refrigerator because we give them to him out of hearts of love, expressions of love, to return an expression of love for the love that he's given us. This is worship. This is acknowledgement. This is reverence. So my challenge for us today is from now and as long as you're on this planet, to consider Saturday night, to begin to prepare for worship, to design your Saturday night. Maybe it's the last few minutes of your night at a time of prayer or Bible study or just a thought before you go to sleep. And your Sunday morning routine, 
to plan those in such a way you are preparing your heart, you're preparing your family for a time of worship. Teach this to your children. Demonstrate this to your spouses. Show that what happens on Sunday morning is vital. It is important. It is necessary. It is an honor to get together and worship our God. Maybe you're here today and the the first gift you need to give to God is you. You would admit, I have never asked Jesus to be the leader and forgiver of my life. I've been coming to church maybe all my life, but I've never come to that point that I personally decided I want to ask Jesus to be the leader and forgiver of my life. In just a minute, we're going to have a time of response. There are going to be people over here in the wings. If you're ready to do that or you have questions about that, they will help, help you with that process. Maybe you are a Christ follower. You have to admit, I have been pursuing the world and I haven't been pursuing God. I put myself in first place, not him. I've neglected him. And I'm ready to get that right today. We can talk about next steps. What does that look like for you? Maybe you need prayer. Maybe God has placed someone on your heart that you care about. And you need to lift them up in prayer. These folks will be happy to help anything that you need. Any questions you have, they're here for you. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll have that time of response. You pray with me. Father God, we thank you that you are holy, and you invite us into your presence. May we never take that for granted. May church never be a ritual for us. May we always be a reflection of our relationship. And God, when we are sinful and disobedient, may we enter in with heads bowed low in confession and repentance. God, if we have a broken relationship, may we restore that relationship before we enter into this place. The cares and the worries of the world that hold us back and oppress us, may we release those to you before we enter in into this place. God, may we commit today that starting on Saturday night, we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us on Sunday morning. But we will redirect our focus towards you. And our goal every Sunday morning will be to lift high the name of Jesus. Because just as those steeples on those churches remind us, Jesus, your name is above every name. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. To God be the glory. Amen. Can we stand and sing this last song together before we're dismissed? And when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply go, longing just to bring oh something that's away that will bless you. Search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. 
Mike and Janet are going to be down here at the front, your front left, and I'll be down here to the front right. And I, from the bottom of my heart, there is no greater privilege I can have today than to be able to pray for you or say for Mike and Janet today. Um, if you need anything, please do not hesitate to come down after service or just stay in your seat. And we'll come by and pray for you there, um, however you want to do it. Don't miss this opportunity to respond to what God is prompting you to do in this moment. Two things for your radar. Um, one, we have a, uh, a class that is starting next Wednesday, October 4th. It's called Get Out of Debt. Uh, this is for anyone uh, in our church. If you've had financial troubles or if you just feel like you could be doing better in the area of uh, stewarding finances, this is for you. Uh, and it's usually $129 cost, but we're covering that for every single person that joins. Uh, child care is available but limited, so parents... Uh, please do that. Sign up very quickly so you make sure to reserve your spot. Second is our next child dedication service is happening uh, October 22nd. The deadline to register for that is the 15th. So if you are uh, ready, to, if you have had, had a child recently and you want to take that step of bring them before the church to dedicate to raising them in the ways of the Lord and your church to dedicate to you to helping you do that, uh, make sure to sign up for that quickly. Uh, one final thing before we go. Um, we have uh, a member of our church who is the president of a, of, of a missions organization. Her name's Donna Poole. Don't know if she is here today or not. She had to work overnight. Uh, she is leaving this week on a medical mission trip to minister to the people of the Dominican Republic and to Haiti, which is a just a, a tumultuous place to be right now. So I would be so grateful if, as a church together, we could pray for Donna and the team that she is going with. Would you bow your heads with me and pray for her? God, thank you so much for Donna Poole. God, thank you for the heart that you've given her, to her for these people. And Lord, as she uh, prepares to leave this week to minister, to provide care, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a place where it's not easy to do that, God, we pray Lord, that you would go with her, that you would protect her and her team. God, that the ministry that they do, Lord, would have a lasting impact, that lives would be changed, that people would be healed, God, physically and spiritually. Lord, we pray divine blessing and favor on her and her team. God, open up doors where they've been closed, God. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I cannot wait to worship with you all again next week. Have a great weekend.